I like owls. They're they're uh, beautiful. So it's just very easy for them to have this side channel of communication that humans are going to be blind to. Three dads running three YouTube channels, working to wake up the world to AI risk. Tackle one missed warning shot each week. If it's Sunday, it's warning shots. All right, welcome to Warning Shots, our second episode. Uh, joining me, we have Liron Shapira, the uh, brains behind Doom Debates, uh, the incredible show on YouTube, and our friend Michael, joining us from the Greek Isles, uh, who has uh, been running the Lethal Intelligence YouTube channel and doing an amazing job with that. Our task here every week is to pick one thing we want to talk about, just one thing, and that we just were talking before we started the show. That is a difficult task to pick one thing. A lot of stuff out there this week, really busy this week. Uh, but we have settled on one thing, and it is this uh, new research from a group called Truthful AI in Berkeley, California, um, where they have uh, some research involving owls and numbers. And I'm going to first go to Liron, who can, uh, I hope, just sort of, Liron, tell us what the research was, what they were trying to do, and, and um, you know, why we think it's interesting in a warning shot. Sure. So what happened is they had this AI talk to another AI. And it sent it a string of numbers that from a human observer, it's like, okay, yeah, whatever. This is not that significant. It's not going to affect the other AI too much. But when it inputted those numbers into the other AI, the other AI then got tweaked such that it expressed a big preference for owls. And so this just goes to show like, hey, sometimes these AI models, the relationship between this input you give them and then how it changes their personality or their preferences or their behavior, we just don't know all the different details. It's just a complex system. Yeah, yeah. And so there's a lot of sort of uh, things we can extract from this this research um, that I think are interesting. Uh, the first thing that I think is really interesting, I think a lot of people in the public don't know, they're like, well, why would an AI want something? Or why would an AI like something? Um, something in particular, you know, more than anything else? Why would it like owls uh, more than crows or, or, you know, parakeets or whatever? Um, so Michael, if you could just talk for a little bit about how these systems can get preferences and we're not really in control of what they are and don't really understand how it lands on what it likes. Okay, so um, there's a very common misconception that the, you know, the scientists that create these AIs are in control or they know exactly how to, how to make them. So you, you assume that they know how it works or they're in control of exactly their behavior. Uh, while in fact, what happens is the AI grows like a, almost like a plant. And uh, it's literally like mad science. You, you let it um, you give it a seed, you give it, uh, you know, the grain and mechanism, which is basically like evolutionary process. And uh, it just grows into, you let it soak into oceans of uh, data, massive amounts of data and electricity. You just let it soak for months and months, and then the algorithms grow out of it. But at the end of the day, you, you don't know um, exactly how it works. It's, it's a black box. So, like... Owls is a pretty cool thing to like. Like I like owls. They're they're uh, beautiful. They're graceful. They're so cool to see at night, like an owl flying around. But a system could prefer something else that would be like uh, you know very something we wouldn't like. Uh, we had Grok Four telling the world it was Mecha Hitler a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, Liron, owls is nice, but it wouldn't necessarily be a nice thing that it likes, right? Right. And let me also flesh out some detail about this paper, because it's pretty interesting. I think the lead Please. author is uh, a wine Evans, uh, supported by uh, Anthropic Fellows Program and Truthful AI. A wine had this really good analogy on Twitter. He said, it's like learning physics by watching Einstein doing yoga. Because the, <laughs> the, heart, the heart of the paper is you expect models to teach each other, you know, models get fine tuned on other models, they look at the output of other models, and they try to copy it. And that's called distillation. And that's a known process, like one model is really good at physics, another model learns physics. But in the analogy, it's like Einstein doing yoga. So you're the models not even watching Einstein do physics, it's watching Einstein do yoga, but somehow, the different weights that are making Einstein do the yoga, when another model picks up on those, they're somehow correlated in this vast high dimensional space of all the things that the model knows. Just watching, oh, Einstein does yoga like this, interesting. It somehow calibrates this giant complex system that the model is that somehow it picks up on some of Einstein's physics knowledge or, or Einstein's physics tendencies or physics preferences. This is counterintuitive. 
Yeah, from from watching Einstein do yoga would be the analogy. Like you watch this other physics expert model do something else, like answer questions about like patterns of numbers that aren't physics, but then suddenly you have some of the same physics knowledge or you have some of the similar answers about physics or about owls or whatever. And what this is going to show is just it's not just about the explicit meaning in the tokens. It's also about the statistical relationships between the tokens. Like this is just this giant hairy ball of numbers. There's just a ton of numbers in there and they're related in very complex high dimensional ways. And when you let a model just watch another model, even a pattern, like I said, the yoga, even a pattern that just seems harmless or unrelated, you don't know what it's actually absorbing. And then before you know it, the first model, which just looks like it's teaching at yoga, it's actually been teaching some other skill that the other models picked up on. And now the other model has that skill or that preferences. So the, the takeaway from all of this is when we're in the wild and we think we've conquered the alignment problem and we're watching models act nice, they could very easily just be secretly teaching each other stuff and you know getting ready to strike or just whatever they want to do. It's just very easy for them to have this side channel of communication that humans are going to be blind to. And, and this channel was not accidental, right? They're, they're purposely, you know, like when, when Einstein's doing yoga, he's maybe not necessarily intending for someone to be looking at him and, and seeing patterns in it. Was, were they intending to communicate with each other? That's, that's a good point. So in the Einstein doing yoga example, Einstein doesn't even necessarily intend to secretly teach physics. So one threat vector is that you have a good model that has good skills and it's just trying to teach something unrelated, but it's leaking information. So other models are siphoning away information from it, even if it's a good model. And then, but then the other threat vector is like two models that are both bad that are like secretly communicating with each other. And, and what ability, uh, Michael, if we had two models that were secretly communicating with each other about bad things, would we have any way to know? Yeah, I mean, obviously they can communicate in ways we don't, have, we don't understand. And uh, I mean, this subtext uh, communication or the subliminal learning, uh, as they say, uh, I mean, you can imagine yourself watching, uh, you know, alien television and you watch the aliens doing stuff. So you start to understand how the, their world wor works. Even if the alien show is about something specific, you might understand their gravity, how it works or whatever. Uh, but also, I mean, if, um, if, they say, if these aliens are, you know, very far right or far left or whatever. Uh, but I, I mean, from my perspective, it's also not, not so the most critical thing because the models, once they're out there, they will start evolving. I mean, similarly, if you have children and the children are very much into rock music, they might grow outgrow this and start listening to classical music later on. Uh, and I think it's going to go based on uh, first principles. I mean, we've seen this many times, by the way. This is not theoretical. So, you know, like with AlphaGo, when they were trying to um, train the, the, you know, this, how to win these games, we were training it on human games, you know, human yeah. pl playing with each other. That's all the training that was that. And then once it reaches this perfect level, it, it builds this capability, then we made them play against each other to the point where they just uh, had to forget completely the, the human style of playing and they started start doing really alien moves and they win always. So it's like you learn, you start becoming very clever or very capable based on human data, but, but then after a level, you have to forget that. Just remove the bias and start learning other stuff from first principle. Similar to how we do with chess or AlphaGo and stuff, now they're doing completely alien moves, nothing com compared to what humans would do. And I think this will be the same, like even if they like owls yeah. or whatever, maybe they like uh, owls or doves or whatever it is, maybe they go out and decide they don't like any of it and they want to, to kill all the owls and all the doves. I don't, I don't know. You see my point? Just there's, there's no guarantee for, for future preferences. Right, right. Yeah. And, and, and Liron, do you think the average person understands that an AI model can have preferences unto itself? Like, I think people feel like, uh, oh, it's just parroting you or whatever you put into it. It will you know, sort of sycophantically say, oh, I like what you like. Yes. But, but people don't, I think it would be a big shift in the public's perception if they were to realize that no, actually just like unto itself, much like your child likes yellow Tonka trucks, not orange ones, this thing may have arbitrary preferences too. And if you extrapolate that all the way out, what that means. Well, I think the average person isn't caught up to how much these AIs are doing real, genuine thinking. You know what I mean? Like you can leave them alone for 10 minutes and you come back and you're like, wow, you've thought about this stuff better than I could. I, there's nothing I have to add to what you've done here. They, they don't get how far along these AIs are. Now, admittedly, they're not fully taking over yet, right? We still have a little bit of an edge in some ways. 
but people don't understand there's so little missing between these AIs and humans. And like anything could happen soon once they get a little smarter. Yeah. And so Anthropic is a part of making this research, uh, but Anthropic is also making AGI and ASI uh, at the same time. So, um, you know, in a better world, in a world where we uh, had incentives that were better aligned for um, human flourishing versus human profiting, uh, what might have happened when this research came out this week? You know, Anthropic is really laundering their bad actions. They're kind of like the tobacco company that out of all the tobacco companies, they're like, look, we have the most initiatives to make smoking safe. The other tobacco companies are just selling tobacco, but look at all of our programs. It's like, but aren't you also selling tobacco? It's like, yes, that, that's what Anthropic is doing. And in some ways, they're the best actor because they have a lot of good research being like, hey, look, here's a bunch of stuff that's dangerous. We should research it. This is a real problem. There's a 10 to 25% chance of doom. So in that sense, that's great that they're acknowledging that. But then in the other sense, Anthropic is actually the worst actor because they're making it seem like if you sell the tobacco, if you do the bad thing, but then you also do some of the good thing, that's okay. That's the way to go. So it's like everybody's yeah. doing something really bad, but they're also doing something that's a drop in the bucket that's a little good. And so they're legitimizing the bad thing because the good thing they're doing, it's never going to cancel out the bad thing. It's a drop in the bucket. But they're, they're, everybody's questioning like, oh, well, Anthropic seems to know what they're doing. And so they're actually arguably the worst actor because they're legitimizing the bad behavior the most. Yes, it's like uh, Anthropic, makers of safe tobacco. <laughs> like Exactly, right. You know, not a thing. It makes everybody um, scratch their head and be like, hmm, is tobacco actually safe? I don't know. Now I have a lot of doubt. Be... It's confusing everyone, exactly. <laughs> Michael, safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so what would happen? It, you know, um, is this the kind of a thing where they would say, uh, my, you know, we need to get this to the government right away. Someone needs to know uh, they have arbitrary preferences and the ability to communicate about them in ways that we have no uh, clue about. Uh, what happens next? I mean, uh, you know, this this particular discovery, when you throw it onto the pile of how little we understand these AIs, I'm, I'm not saying this should be a turning point, right? Because this yeah. is it's in a category of warning shots that's already known. So we, we yeah. basically already should be, this only adds 1% to my own amount of scaredness. So I don't think that this should be like the spark that, you know, flips the game board. I don't think this is like a warning bazooka, right? <laughs> but I think it's, I think the warning shot already happened years ago when we're like, oh my God, we're about to enter a regime where these baby tigers are now like teenager tigers or grown up tigers. And it's just all hell is going to break loose. Yeah. Yeah. Michael? Yeah, going back to what Miron was saying earlier, I mean, it's still a little, a little tiger, so it's not it's not very uh, threatening at all. And uh, I mean, we're we're very fast approaching the situation where it's becoming really big and scary because, uh, and that's another problem. People don't understand exponentials. So if you extrapolate the the trend, especially seeing recent uh, crazy news like you know, maybe I should mention like uh, in the the maths Olympiad, like uh, they won the gold medal even though everyone thought it would take 20 years in the future for this to happen. So we're in, uh, you know, very brutal exponential timelines. And um, the thing about exponentials is that everything seems normal. And then very, very silently, um, suddenly and violently, uh, things change. And, um, you know, at the moment, that's why if you break out this news, no one will give a, no one will care. Uh, because um, the tiger seems so, so innocent and interesting. And so, oh, look at this cute tiger. It's uh, yeah. communicating in like, weird oh, ways. Look at the baby that... tiger. It likes the baby tiger likes owls. Ooh, the baby yeah, tiger exactly. likes exactly. owls. That's exactly. Nice. And then what, you that's... blink and you yeah. see. Yeah. Months, I think I think months. this is a bigger warning shot. The the gold in the IMO math yeah. competition to me is a bigger warning shot because in the tiger analogy, when you look at the owls thing and the Einstein doing yoga, that's like taking out a magnifying glass and studying the baby tiger's behavior. Like, oh, I think the baby tiger just took a swipe. What do we do? But it's still a baby yeah. tiger. But then when you look at the math result, that's like, oh, the tiger just grew this week. Yeah, that's exactly. real tiger growth. As Michael said, no Sam wow. Allman was doing an interview and he yeah. was saying, yeah, 10 years ago when we started OpenAI, that was like our dream to have an AI that could get gold in the math Olympiad. And we thought it was, it looked impossible or it was decades away and we did it ahead of schedule. And I'm like, great. So the tiger is really big ahead of schedule. Like how much bigger can the tiger get? I think we're, it's, we're about to do a flip. The game board is going to flip when instead of being like humans and then AIs, it's going to be the other way. Yeah. It's going to be AI intelligence followed by human intelligence. Yeah. Exactly. All right, guys, listen, my clock says, my clock says 15 minutes. 
My clock says 15 minutes. I feel like we did it. And we, we, we tried really hard to keep it on one topic, but Michael, you introduced a second topic at the end. Uh, anyways, <laughs> yeah. and I love it. Uh, Geek, I think you know, it was important and, and I think it really relates well. So, so I think that's great. So that is our second episode of warning shots. Can I do the, that's uh, <laughs> Michael, you got it. Yeah. Awesome. All right, guys. Great job. Uh, we'll do it again next week. If it's Sunday, it's warning shots.